Hello and welcome to this Q&A session post the screening of The Father with the screenwriter Christopher Hampton. Um, and Christopher, hello and congratulations on your BAFTA for Best Adapted Screenplay. Thank you very much, Francie. Thank you. So, but your, your association with director Florian Zella and, uh, and with The Father goes back some time, doesn't it? And presumably your association with Florian Zella even before that, how far? Well, uh, the play was first on in, in Paris, I think in 2013. And I, I was, he was sort of on my radar, Florian. I had been to Paris before to see an earlier play called The Truth, which is a comedy. Uh, and, and which sort of piqued my interest and I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, I just thought it, it, it was very funny actually. Uh, and so I went back the next year to see his new play, which had very good reviews. And, um, and he, he was there that, that evening. Um, so I met him then and the play was, you know, it just sort of knocked me out. So afterwards I just said to him, Do you, you know, can I, can I translate this for you and see if we can get it on in, in English? Uh, and it was, so that was the, the beginning of it. And, and so, and, and, and I also felt that the, the, the play was, The Father was a very, very good introduction for him in, in English, uh, rather than any of his other um, um, extant plays. So I sort of said, said, I think this would be a really good play to start, to start, start you off in. Yeah, oh, I might come back to why, why you think it was particularly good one in English, but um, but as I understand, I never saw it on stage. As I understand it, um, it's it's quite different in a sense. Maybe not so much different in terms of the words, but um, in terms of the approach, the way that we're. I mean, in terms of an adaptation from stage to screen, this is quite radical in some ways. What, 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 there was a sort of device, a theatrical device uh, during the play, which was that, um, uh, I mean, it was in a number of scenes and between the, between the scenes, um, uh, you know, there'd be a kind of 10 second break and furniture would begin to disappear from the stage, little bits and pieces of furniture would disappear. And, uh, and then um, at, at the end, you were left with a, a bare stage and a hospital bed. And, uh, um, uh, and we wanted to find a kind of cinematic equivalent for that. And the, what we came up with was, and if you, if you were to read the script, you'd see that um, the idea was to have the same set pretty well all the way through, but to redecorate it or you know, make subtle changes to it. So um, where the script gets quite complicated is that you know, these sets are known as one, two, three, four, and five. So, each scene in the in the screenplay has an exp, exp, explanatory number on it, which tells you uh, which state of decor there should be at that particular time. Um, also, we, uh, I mean, I mean, it's not a long play; it lasts about a hundred minutes. But and, the, and I think the film is like ninety-seven minutes. But in fact, we cut quite a lot of it um, because we we under, we realised that there was there was a lot of there were moments when we wanted to stop uh, the film and just and just sort of contemplate either you know the brooms in the house or or or, or, or you know some some uh, or just a sort of punctuation really um, and and uh, and those those really were the, the the major changes. The text was the text was as I say trimmed, but it was pretty much it was pretty much the same. Um, and um, uh, it, it, it was a it was an interesting process actually because uh, we we met and just, and talked about the sort of philosophy of the screenplay and how you know what we wanted to be in it and how we wanted to approach it. Because there's all sorts of things you could do. You could you know you, you usually tell when you when you adapt a play for the screen that you should uh, go outside a lot and. Uh, um, you know, have a lot of scenes that you can't have in the theatre. Uh, but in fact, what we decided to do was to sort of go inside um, and make it even more claustrophobic and sort of accept the premise that the whole, that what we were seeing was the inside of somebody's head. Um, and and um, so, so, that, so, so, so what happened was that having had this conversation, Florian then wrote a script in French, which he sent me. 
and I rewrote it in English, making changes, um, suggested suggested changes, uh, and then he did another draft, accepting some, and in fact he did a third draft um, with his own changes as well in French, and then I did a fourth draft in English, uh, and then we met for I had about a week in Paris, and uh, uh, and sort of went through it line by line. And that was what we shot. That was what Florian shot. It was. It, we didn't make any changes after that on the set or with the actors or anything. And, and we didn't. Uh, Florian decided rather boldly because he'd never directed a film before, not to have any rehearsal, just to turn up on the first day and start shooting. And um, and it was. Um, we only had twenty five days, shooting time, which is very you know it's like when I first had my first film as a director, I had fifty days. So. I, and I thought that was pretty tight. But, but I mean, that was the thing that struck me when I saw it uh, the first time. I've, I've seen it twice. In fact. Well, the first time I saw it was that how it, people always say, you know, you have, if you're going to have an adaptation, it has to be cinematic, obviously. And it was cinematic, but not in the sense that people understand of great vistas or landscapes or depth of shot, or although there is some of that as well. Um, and, and I thought that was what was so interesting and so radical about it was, as you say, creating this kind of claustrophobia. So when you're writing it, how do you, how do you make it cinematic without making it spectacular? Well, it was just the principle that we had. We, we had once we made that decision, which was actually the first, really the first decision we made, how are we going to do this? We're going to make it inward. We're going to take it inward. We're going to, we're going to, you know, not see the whole thing through. Um, I mean, there's a way of doing it where you see it all through the protagonist's eyes and, you, you know, people could change in front of his eyes or, you know, whatever. None of that. We didn't want to do any of that. We wanted to keep a, a big... So, so one of the things that impresses me most about Florian's work is that, uh, uh, well, the sort of unique thing about it is that it's very, very original, but it's also extremely simple. And that's a, quite a rare... Quite a rare combination, and I'm, uh, you know, uh, uh, first-time film directors often, you know, throw the palette at, at what they, you know, they try and do everything and shoot between people's legs and up people's noses and so on, and and it was he just wanted to do it very very. He, he had a very clear image of what he wanted to do, and he wanted to do it very very simply, and he wanted to do it with the best possible actors, so, mm. um, and sort of I think succeeded on all those on all those. Um, grounds. And presumably one of the things about, if, if you say in the staging that gradually, you know, a chair was taken away or there was a, certain elements of, of the set removed, then that is giving the audience a slight, I mean, it's a slight clue of what's happening. It seems to me that, that, that the film treatment is much more mysterious. It is. It works much more like a, it, it works much more, more like a, a, a puzzle, but a puzzle that, that you're never going to quite get to the to the bottom of or, or find an answer to. Um, and the other thing that's that's um, uh, sort of emphasized in a kind of way in the film, although it's not very different from, from the play, is that it's when it starts, it looks like a naturalistic film about a man who's got, you know, who's in a, in a, has a problem and is, and, and you think, oh, I see, it's one, going to be one of those films where, you know, scratch. And then, and then the film sort of pulls, up, pulls the rug from under everybody's feet. Um, in a in a in I think quite an unexpected way, and after that you're on your own really, um, because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily make sense. But but the the you know the the rationale is that of course, um, it doesn't make sense. You know the condition doesn't make sense. But yeah, as you say, it, it doesn't make sense. But how then do you keep a kind of momentum? I mean, it sort of does and it doesn't make sense. So how do you keep that momentum going through? Well, that's what we were, you know, you gamble and you hope that it's going to, it's, you hope it's going to work. I think the editor, Yorgos Lamprinos, uh, uh, um, because I, 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 would, I, would, I haven't got precise figures, but I, my think, theory is that the, 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 the first cut was maybe five or six minutes longer. Um, and it, that bit of cutting, plus a little bit of reorganization of, of the order of the scenes in the middle, um, we're all we're all shaped towards that purpose of of keeping the tension up and keeping it keeping it keeping it 
you know, keeping everybody, as it were, on the edge of their seat mm -hmm. um, because you don't know what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's 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 um, you know less linear than the than the play certainly, uh, and uh, and um, more more unpredictable, I would say. Mm. And there are sort of things that, on, on a second viewing, and, and I've looked at the, the screenplay as well, that uh, you see that there are elements of repetition, um, uh, things that actually you're not necessarily because you're sort of watching in one area and you haven't noticed things. I mean, rather like the decor of, of the flat itself, yeah. you simply don't notice it. I mean, you're so focused on those performances that, that you're thinking, oh, well, I thought that was a bit, but you know, you're, you're not yourself that um, concern, so you are with him all the time. And that's the important, I mean, I suppose that then raises the question that how crucial was the casting? Well, he, uh, Florian was absolutely determined to have Anthony Hopkins. I said, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, when, and, you know, to the extent of wanting to call the character Anthony. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, when we'd done the script, um, we, I, I mean, I've done, actually done two films before, a long, long time ago with, um, with Anthony Hopkins. Um, I, I did a, uh, my very first screenplay was uh, based on Ibsen's Doll's House. And he, he, he and Claire Bloom played the leads in that. Um, and then, um, and then he, um, he was in a film called The Good, Fa the Good Father, which Mike Newell did in the eighties. Um, so I knew him um, uh, and I'd known him. Well, I hadn't seen him since he resettled in America, but I, I sort of knew him. So <clears throat> I guess there was a kind of, familiar name on the title page uh, but anyway we just we sort of sent it and very quickly we had a we had an answer saying he he, he thought it was amazing and, and and could we go and meet him I think he want you know he wanted to he, he was aware that Florian never made a film before um, so Florian and I went to Los Angeles and, and met him and within you know five minutes in he said yes yes uh, 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 and then he said while he was doing this film, The Two Popes, he said, can you wait for me? So I said, <laughs> Florian and I looked at each other, said, yes, yes, I, I think we can manage that. I, I did wonder when I was reading the screenplay, whether you had had him in mind at any stage, because there, there, there's just elements of, of the way that- Florian always had him in mind. And therefore, when I was writing the English dialogue, uh, yes. I ha very much had his voice in my ear. Yes. And his his you know his that characteristic yeah uh, and this manner of of um of the way the way he delivers lines kind of fed into the to the writing a bit so there's quite short little phrases and yes. his very particular yes Hopkinsonian way of, yes. of delivering things so. Yes. so the rest of the cast then and then well then we were very lucky with Olivia Coleman because she it was all the Crown business going on but um uh. I'd also worked with her before, so, uh, but I, it wasn't, in this case, it wasn't me, it was obviously Anthony, who was the attraction, and she she also liked the script very much, and, and did, did you know, fiddle things around so that she could be with us for the, the, number, of, the number of days required, which was, as I said, not, not all that many, um, and, and brought this, um, you know, sort of complete, Authenticity that is her is her, her, her characteristic. She she just you just completely believe every single thing she does, in a in a remarkable way. I can't quite understand how she does it, but it is amazing. So were you on set during filming? I I was uh, most most as much as I could be. Uh, as it happened, I mean you know on the principle of buses coming along three at a time. Uh, I had my play um, with Maggie Smith that was rehearsing at the same time um, and a television series which was shooting in Malaysia so I, I, I was flitting about a bit um, but um, I, I think I was there for at least half the shooting and, uh, and certainly the first week, 10 days uh, and then I came back uh, at the end. Um, and it was an absolute privilege to be on the set. It was so, it was so um, sort of enjoyable and impressive at the same time. Um, um, in, and enjoy, impressive 
in what sense, because it's interesting you said there was no rehearsal. So was it, were there unlimited takes or did you not even need that or were things worked out on set? Anthony is tremendously prepared. He, 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 he's just famously prepared. Um, and so he came on knowing what he was, what he wanted to do. And actually we didn't do many takes um, most of the time. Of course, the, the most, my most vivid memory is the, the shooting of the final scene. Um, and what you see in the film is, is I think the first take. I think, the, we, we'd, I think it was designed to be done without a cut. I think there might be a cut in it uh, at one point, but, uh, but, but essentially the, the, the front half of the scene where he breaks down and everything was the first take. Um, and we were all shattered by it, I think. And uh, finally, Florian <laughs> plucked up the courage to ask him if he would, if he would do another take and, and he didn't want to, he didn't want to. Uh, and I mean, he wasn't unreasonable about it. He, he just said, I, I don't think it'll get any better than that. Um, and so every, there was a sort of 45 minute pause um, and then he decided he would, he, you know, he would do another take, but he, he was right. The first, he, you know, he was never going to get better than he, than he was in, on the first take. Mm. Um, so it was astonishing. Mm. Um, and, 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 you know, a, 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 I think a lot of the stuff we used was either first, first take or second take. Um, he, he, he's, he just, he and Olivia as well, they both nailed it every time. And all the other actors were, there, there wasn't any, you know the actors were all terrific, and they were all. I think because of because of Anthony, they were all on their top game. You know. Yeah, and there is this lovely kind of sinister line that runs through. You know, the man in the apartment, whether it's uh, whether it's the husband or the person who later is revealed as the the nurse um, in the nursing home. Um, that that sort of sinister mood is 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 brilliantly sort of as it were, batted between the two of them, including that extraordinary line, which, which just really shakes you, I think, of the thing about, you know, how long are you going to stay around here getting on everybody's tits or whatever it is, which is just sort of unlike anything else in the whole thing. Well, when I was doing the, when I was translating the play, I mean, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that, um, that Florian's um, favourite playwright is Pinter. Yeah. Uh, and that, and that Pinter has been, been a, a sort of great influence on him. And somehow that line came in, into my head as a very sort of Pinterish line. Yeah. Could be, you know, something from the homecoming or, you know. Um, so once I'd thought of it, um, <laughs> I just, I mean, it's a slightly free translation of the French, but I can't remember what the French is, but, uh, but, uh, um, but, it, but it, it conveyed the mood. Um, and, and it was important to find a phrase that stuck in your head so that when the different character used it, you know, you'd notice. Yeah, no, it, it, but it, it, as you say, it's that sort of Pinterest um, mixture of, of menace and that sort of slight colloquial absurdity, almost anachronous, you know, it's a sort of really odd kind of, yeah. <laughs> a, mm. good, a good, fantastic line that just really makes you shiver. But, uh, okay, so on to translation. I mean, somebody actually um, has sent in a, a question about translation, which is obviously something you know <laughs> a lot about. And indeed, I think Anne's occupation in the... Uh, is she yes, she's a translator, yes. She's a translator in, in this two Olivia Coleman's character. Um, so you work you work from the French. You don't use any... No, I, 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 I studied French and German, so... And I, I kept up my French, so... My German's a bit rusty, but I kept up my French, and uh, um, so uh, and it, 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 you know, it's been, a, it's actually a lot of it's a huge strand of my work has to do with French themes of one sort or another. Um, so, so, I, and I've, and I've, ever since I was when when I was young, young, I got a job at the Royal Court in the literary department, and one of the things they, they had just sort of invented at the Royal Court was the idea of getting contemporary playwrights to translate the classics rather than doing them out of the Penguin or Oxford, you know, academic translations. And they just hired me to, to do a version of Uncle Vanya um, in about 1970 and, uh, and a doll's house. Uh, so 
I, I, I found it very, very, I found the business of translating very, very enjoyable. And it's completely different from writing your own stuff. Um, it's like a huge number of small decisions instead of a small number of huge decisions. Uh, uh, and it's, it's like, it's like, I mean, I've said this before, but it's like going to the gym, do, you know, you do an hour or so of translation before you start, the, you know, at the beginning of the day. And it's very, very good for your, your writing muscles. Um, so I've done it all through, all through my career, but, but only, uh, in, 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 you know, in the last 20, 25 years or so, I've started doing writers who are alive, like Yasmina Reza or, or, or Florio. And, uh, and it's, it's not, uh, I mean, people sometimes ask me if, you know, do you, do you, uh, what changes do you make? And the answer is I don't make any changes. I try to, I try to deliver the play exactly as it's written in the most effective way for, a, for an English speaking audience. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a sort of, um, uh, the, the point of being the translate, uh, translator is, is to be invisible really to be a sort of pane of glass through which the original piece of work is clearly seen. But are there specific things that you think about, if, as you say, you're translating it for um, an English speaking audience, um, are there slight cultural changes, do you think? I mean, I, said, I know it's only France to hear about even so. Uh, I think so. For example, there's a line in the, there's a line in the, um, in the piece uh, where, she says she's going to Paris um, and he says we well, can't go to Paris they don't even speak English um, and in the French it's the other way around she wants she wants to go to London and he, he says we well, can't go to London it rains all the time yeah. so so that's you see what I mean there's a it's you it's a question of finding an equivalent um, um, in uh, uh, that makes sense and I understand that, that the play is in, if not inspired by, it has bears some relationship to uh, Florence Zella had a, had a relative who had dementia. Um, and, uh, so, I mean, is, do you think there's any, there's no difference presumably between attitudes towards within that kind of middle-class home or between attitudes towards dementia in France or Britain? I mean, that was, that was a universal thing, do you think? I wouldn't have thought so. I mean, it was particular. It was particularly personal to, to Florian because of, he was very close to his grandmother, and it, and he was a teenager when when it all happened. So, mm -hmm. I think it was a particularly vivid experience. Um, I think we've all had those sorts of experiences. In my case, it's actually the two, the two teachers who I most owe most to and were most uh, important in my life. They both uh, got dementia, which is particularly sort of upsetting because they're because they were people that you you associated with them um, with being extremely sharp and, and and intelligent and and you know on on the money whenever they open their mouths and so therefore it it, it really is uh, alarming when 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 something like that happens yeah and, and and actually in particular in the case of a teacher that would be where your common ground particularly would be wouldn't it yeah, on, yeah, on right. those sort of things and so well I, I think that it, it did capture very well that um I mean that there is the sinister sense of you know what is happening to Anthony but there is also that sense that the kind of withdrawal of personality or the withdrawal of empathy that dementia sometimes brings is quite sinister to those who are closest to it do you think that's true Yes, I think that uh, I mean, I mean, um, what what Florian's brought out so well is that uh, you don't know what's going to emerge. Whether it's sometimes it's sometimes it's really, you know, what they say is really cruel and upsetting. Um, uh, sometimes it's, you know, heartbreaking. You know, be because they suddenly, turn, you know, they suddenly become very dependent or or, or, what or whatever. But but it's in a way. It's. I think what I think it's some somebody whose character you know so well and have known so well for such a long time, beginning to exhibit different traits of character that you've never seen before. I mean, I think that's what's most most alarming uh, about about the condition. When we were rehearsing the play the first time, we got, we had a, a neurologist come in to talk to the to the actors about about Alzheimer's. 
uh, and of course the brutal thing about it is that it it, ha it sort of happens to you when you're in your 20s right. um, and it's and it's symptomless until it it begins to manifest and then it's too late to do anything about it if there, if we could somehow devise a way of spotting it when it first arrived we could you know rather like catching cancer very early we could we could uh, i mean i think that's what they're working on we could we could hope you know possibly eradicate it but it by the time it the, its particular feature is that by the time you see it you there's nothing you can do about it no exactly so um um were i mean where people, well, I suppose, by the time you, you'd written the play and, the, and between play and, and, and screenplay, there's there's no further need to just talk to neurologists or people who've had experience of, of it at all. No, uh, uh, to go off on a slightly different um, tangent, uh, uh, what was in, what was interesting was people's initial reluctance as far as the, the piece was concerned. In other words, uh, when we when, when I first translated it, in, 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 uh, we couldn't get it on in London. We got it on. Um, at the Ustinov Theatre in Bath, a studio theatre, 100 seats, where it was, you know, very, very powerful and worked very, very well. But there was great scepticism about whether or not it should come into London or not. And people saying, you know, do, do you really think people want to come and see this sort of thing? And so we sort of crept into, and we went to the, the what was then the Kiln Theatre in, in Kilburn. So we started on the fringe, as it were, and then eventually went into the West End, but people were still saying, as we went into the West End, you, you think that, that this is a commercial play, do you think people will pay to come and see this sort of thing? Uh, and in fact, they did in such numbers that, you know, we over, we sold out and then had to, a different theatre had to be found <laughs> to, to extend the run. Uh, so it, it it is a tough subject, and it, but it, but it's, but it's something that everybody, re I think everybody relates to. And Florian has often spoken about how, how many people have, have approached him or written to him or contacted him about, um, uh, 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 you know, about how, how touched they've been by, by, the, by the subject and by the, the, the way the play is, mm. it, 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 or the film has, has affected them. Mm. But it's one thing to have a critical and indeed commercial success on the stage. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be easy to make a film. So was was that a struggle? It certainly was. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you'd have thought um, with those those actors, but um, it was really really hard to raise. Uh, I think the film's made for about five million dollars, uh, and it was really hard to raise that. Uh, and so we didn't. You know, we were. Certain, certain amount of flailing about and panicking towards the end, and 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 uh, until we until we found the last bit of money. Mm. Mm. So, um, and this is this is a question that's that's been sent in by um, somebody listening, which is, um, when you are writing for the stage, you're obviously you know you're thinking about the audience point of view. Um, when you have to adapt to a play for the screen then suddenly all kinds of things about shots and camera angles and all, all of that comes into play um i mean does that require does that be for you require kind of starting fresh or or thinking about it completely from scratch well i think there are various things to say i mean i think that what you what you don't do generally in a screenplay is is, is uh, advise the director what <laughs> Where to put the camera? <laughs> they tend to, they tend to not appreciate that. So, so it's so writing a script is just like you know writing the blueprint for a for a, a film. Which, but but what I discovered was that uh, I mean it took me a very it, it, whereas I started in in the theatre relatively smoothly, it took me a long time to figure out how to write films. I I. I had a, an, um, a delusion, which was that the, that, it, that it must be, because plays are so technical and they're, they're very complicated to, to sort of, and I thought, well, it must be easier to write films. Uh, consequently, I wrote very bad films for, for about 10 years until it dawned on me that it's even more difficult because, because the um, unlimited sort of liberty that you had imposes on you a, a a responsibility to to really focus on what 
on what uh, what's going to be effective um, in any in any at any given stage of the of the film. I mean, I learned a lot from. I, I did spend a year writing a film for David Lean based on Conrad's Nostromo, which, uh, alas, he died a few weeks before shooting. Um, uh, but but uh, in the course of that year, I did learn an awful lot about about the difference between um, writing films and writing writing for the theatre. I mean, Lean used to say that 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 actually, uh, you, uh, most films are you can break up into six or eight or 10 blocks. And within those blocks, you really have, you, you, it's like a rope going through them. You can't let go of the rope. You have to take the audience. And he always thought that, um, being an editor, I suppose, he always thought that the, the final image of one scene and how it married with the first image of the next scene was the crucial thing to think. Of. And these were things I'd never really, th you know, hadn't really thought about in, in uh, earlier, in earlier spring. Yeah, I suppose. Um, so, so I did learn, learn a lot from him. Mm. And, and he's and, famous for that, of course, most famous in the match in, uh, in Lawrence. Yes, quite. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah. No, sorry, sorry, were you going to say something else about the differences? Yeah, yeah, I think I think I was going to go on further and say that. Um, it's somehow much more difficult to adapt a play for the for the screen than than a novel. I mean, I in my mind, rightly or wrongly, novels and films are rather um, they that they, they, um, similar in in some ways, and 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 the, and they uh, one adapts quite easily into into the other. Uh, uh, I I find with plays, you've just got to forget them, throw them away, and start again because. Because if you have too much, if a, if a if a film sort of smells of the theatre, mm. as we've as we've often seen they do, yeah. it, it doesn't work. Um, so it's it's really crucial to to um, to reconceive um, in a, a, a play script in in cinematic terms. Uh, from from scratch, um, and I think that I I guess the first time I did that was Dangerous Liaison. I had previously done a couple of play adaptations, which were just just at, just you know kind of reorganising the play a bit, uh, and not going through that going through that process of rethinking it in terms of in terms of the differences between between the mediums. Mm. And do you have a preference for which? Medium. I mean, do you find? Yeah, I love I, lo I love writing films, um, but then it's all usually absolute hell. Um, uh, but I like I I've, and I find writing plays very very difficult. But once I've written them, I love. That's what I like most is rehearsing, rehearsing in the theatre and and putting plays on. Uh, it's what what gives me most um, enjoyment. But uh, but but right. But I but I've always loved writing films. Uh, well, you know, once I sort of figured it out, but but the sort of the idea of the endless drafts and rewrites and you can, I mean, maybe you don't have that. That can be very, yeah, that can be really tiresome. And, it, and what's really soul destroying is when you, as, as sometimes happens, when you get yourself into a position where, where you feel each draft is a sort of diminishment rather than a, mm. um, a, a and that that good things are sort of slipping away and that everybody's forgotten yeah. what they've thought of in the. Yeah. You know, I remember having some meeting in Los Angeles where I said, you know, by a series of tiny adjustments to this character, we've now got him facing in completely the opposite direction from from where we started, and he's a completely different person. Uh, but we, which we've done by you know totally sort of gradual means. Uh, and I have to say that 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 uh, I mean, if, if the father's if the father. Is 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 successful? It, it's I think largely because we, we sort of knew what we were doing, mm. what we wanted to do. We did it, and then and then there were no changes made. Um, and actually, much the same as I could say much the same about Dangerous Liaison. Um, whereas uh, whereas other films I've worked on, 
some of which I like very much, but 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 you 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 kind of think, well, I don't know why I don't know you know you know what why have they lost that bit and why have they insisted on adding that bit? Um, uh, of course, as a as a writer for 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 the cinema, you, you you know you have to acknowledge the fact that it's a director's medium and therefore you are working for the director, and you have to try to supply the director with 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 what they want, what they have in mind. Yeah. And that doesn't happen in the theatre, because the theatre is a writer's medium. Uh, and basically in the theatre, everyone's running around trying to, trying, to, trying to supply what you want as the writer, um, at least in this country. Um, it doesn't, it isn't, we're, we're very lucky in this country, in, in the, on the continent, of course, they have the dreaded director's theatre. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> the, but um, and what about you know you you've obviously directed films as well. Is that pleasurable or is that? I mean, I know so many directors who say you know in retrospect, yes, very satisfying, but so exhausting at the time. I absolutely, I absolutely loved it. Um, <laughs> I absolutely loved it, and and uh, uh, but but I was on a, a panel, uh, a BAFTA a Q and A, with Tom Stoppard and Stephen Frears. And Tom had directed Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, the film, and I just directed Carrington. And we were both talking about how, how much we'd enjoyed ourselves, how, how, how nice it was to be able to go out and then, and not be, everything be completely dependent on you and the wretched bit of paper. Uh, and it was, what fun it was, it was like a holiday. Um, and we went on in this vein, uh, at which point Stephen leant forward slightly and said, that's because you're not directors. <laughs> and that's, I'm sure, a great amount of truth in that. And actually, as I went on, as I directed more films and learned more about it, I began to understand even more what he, what he meant. Yeah. So for you, the, the true satisfaction is probably in the writing, then, do you think? I, th I think so, yes. I mean, I, I, I really did love directing films, and I directed three mm. in a fairly short space of time. And then I kind of decided that... Uh, I wouldn't mind doing. I wouldn't mind doing one or two more, but I, I kind of decided that my, my particular uh, gifts were better employed writing. And do you think it's a good time for writers? Because I mean, writers are. It's actually quite interesting. You know, there's a film obviously in contention for always. Is it Mank, which is about the so-called overlooked writer and, and the idea of the writer in, in Hollywood and indeed elsewhere in the film industry being the least regarded person. I mean, do you think that that's changing? Do you think the the success of long form television has actually brought the writer further to the front. Yeah, I do think that's, uh, I do think the, the situation of writers has improved a great deal. And more, of course, what's really common now, um, start, it started in, uh, in Europe more than here, but what's really common now is the writer director. Yeah. And I suspect the future is, is with the writer director um, because, you know, the, then there's no possibility of misunderstanding. <laughs> Um, and I must say that, um, you know, I've worked a lot in, in Hollywood, particularly in the, you know, after Liaison in the 90s, uh, I worked a lot in Hollywood and I was, it, it was, it's pretty soul destroying because sometimes you, you write something that you, you think is really one of the best things you've done or maybe, you know, you feel it's, it's, it's bound to be a, a really significant film. And through, a, not really through malice or stupidity or anything, but just through that thing of falling through the cracks, it somehow doesn't get made. Um, and that's very, um, you know, that's very uh, soul destroying. Um, and I, th I think that uh, uh, in a way, that's why I've, I've always wanted to stay working in the theater because the theater doesn't, doesn't, give you those kinds of disappointments it, it it actually honors the contract of putting the play on um whereas uh, with films you don't know what the hell's going to happen i mean you literally are going into the casino and putting your money down and you might you might uh, you might win big or you might go home broke <laughs> But, but there is, you know, if you, if you look around at the films that have been, I know we are in an extraordinary period, but if you look at a lot of the films that are, are out there, there's, you know, the word still matters, dialogue still matters, doesn't it? I think this has been a very interesting year in all sorts of ways. I mean, I think the whole, the, this, this whole of sort of um, consciousness of diversity has been tremendously uh, um, 
positive thing. Uh, and it's really, you know, put people on their toes um, uh, in all kinds of ways. And, uh, and I, I actually think it's a very, I think it's a very interesting crop of films this year. Uh, and I guess, I guess, I guess if there hadn't been the pandemic, the list of films at the awards ceremonies and so on might be quite different, but uh, mm. um, who knows? But, um, but, it, but, it, but it has released a kind of um, certain energies, which I think are, are, are beneficial. Um, and a question, so I'm just wondering if there are kind of, for you, unexplored themes or characters, I mean, that's, that's quite a wide category, but other particular areas or a kind of, a kind of film that you've never really done and you would like to do? Well, you know, that I just spent my whole career trying to do completely different things from what I did last time. And rather than what you've just suggested, I, I, I feel a sort of narrowing down now. A lot of the work I've done in the last three or four years has been to do with um, Europe just before the Second World War. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have a, a, a new play which has been on in in, in, in Vienna. Um, and uh, in fact, two, uh, the, the last three or four things that I've written have all been to set in that time and and kind of looked at what it was like to live through um, the sort of lead up to fascism. And I suppose uh, it's quite, it, you know, it's not difficult to understand why, because there's been a very, it's been a very scary time the last five years, I would, I would think. And so uh, this is, I can't remember this ever happening to me before. I, I've really thought, well, this, you know, I ought to try and uh, write about subjects of, um, you know, racism and kind of mindless, acceptance of authority and all, all those things that have kind of been troubling us in the last in the last few years which is why I did the, the play with Maggie Smith German life which was about Goebbels as secretary which was about you know is it possible to take no notice whatsoever of what's going on what's going on what, what's going on around you even if what's going on around you is mass murder um, uh, so, so those things are, uh, you know, continue to to preoccupy me at the moment. Mm. And is there a kind of satisfaction in, in feeling that that you are sort of drilling down into one particular area? Yeah, I suppose. I, I mean, I've I've always been very, you know, I've been very lucky because I've been very free to and just followed my instincts. Well, you know, for however many years it's been, but. So, so I, I feel very privileged in that in that sense, and some, but somehow I, I'm, I'm psychologically being driven towards the, the, this area at the moment, and and I just, I, I'm just yielding to it. Mm. And it is, um, it is fascinating that whole question of, I mean, particularly now when we think that we're so well informed about everything because we're bombarded with information. I mean, the, uh, the extent to which we are informed about the things that we will know in 20 years time mattered <laughs> is, yeah. is something we can't always be aware of. And that, I guess, maybe is the world of art. I suppose so. I mean, it, it, you know, if you, if you see someone like Trump consciously or unconsciously using all the, um, um, all the techniques of mm -hmm. Goebbels mm -hmm. uh, and you know, systematically lying to to the people until they're so crazed with misinformation that they don't know what they're doing. Um, you know, in that in that instance, it's easier to write about Goebbels than to write about Trump. Um, uh, but it, but writing about Goebbels makes you feel that you're writing about Trump. Well, well, we are now out of time, but Chris Hampton, thank you so much. Congratulations again on the BAFTA and congratulations on The Father generally, which is, I think, a triumph in all sorts of ways. And I think we'll go on being watched for years and years to come as well. So thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.